All right, we're recording. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Lovely to have you all this evening. My name's uh, Nigel Guillaume, and I am the Lead Training Programme Director for the St Mary's Scheme. Hopefully you can all see this. I'm hoping you can. Uh, let me just hide a few panels here, and then we're going to get going in terms of the slideshow. All right, so uh, you may see a little bit of a, a grey bar on the side. That's just the chat group, which I just need to keep going so I can keep an eye on uh, what's going on. Um, a few more people coming into the waiting room area. Just going to let those guys in. OK, so the SCA. Goodness me, goodness me, goodness me. Yes, new times, but uh, actually, you know, we can face this. We can do this. Um, so uh, I've been teaching for the MRCGP now for about 20 years. So um, some of you being very nice in your comments there, experience rather than just feeling old. I do feel a little bit old, I have to say, because I've seen it all. I've seen it through the old MRCGP, through to the CSA, through to the RCA, and I'll still be here for the SCA. Um, and very, very happy to help you. So, OK, let's kick off. So the old days, I suppose, what we started to look at in terms of just, I suppose, narratives, was the old MRCGP, something that I did a very, very long time ago. And I suppose akin to the RCA, it was very much about sort of ticking those boxes. But as you know, um, having gone through perhaps some of you, the RCA or seen your peers go through it, uh, that exam was not standardized. So it was very, very difficult. So obviously, when we turned to the CSA, um, we started to look at, um, you know, very standardized cases, but it was termed the clinical skills assessment because examination, physical examination, was part of that. Now, obviously, physical examination is not going to have any part to play uh, in the new SCA, which is all going to be remote. So when we start looking at this, it's important to start thinking about our experience in terms of remote consultations, because that's not easy, you know, necessarily doing 12 back to back uh, remote consultations with quite a lot of case notes. And we're going to start having a look at that in a tick. So actually making sure that uh, your practices are equipped up for that and actually you have the experience of that is, is important. You know, doing a face to face consultation is very different from doing um, a remote consultation where you don't necessarily get to put hands on patients in terms of physical examination. So it might be quite useful for us to do a poll uh, before we kick off, if that's OK. So let's launch a poll. Uh, the poll really is looking at um, those of you who are predominantly doing remote consultations as opposed to those of you who may be doing like 50-50 to those of you who are not doing any at all. So I'm going to launch the poll just to get a flavour for uh, who's doing what and I'd like you to all answer it please. Remote consultations. What percentage of patients are you seeing remotely over video is what I would like to say, specifically video actually. Hey, this is really interesting. OK, keep going, guys. Got about 85 percent of you who've answered. Let's see, let's see, let's see. Anyone else for anyone else? I'm going to close the poll at around sort of 90 percent uh, when we've answered. So about 85 percent of you have answered so far. Anyone else for anyone else? All right, let's stop it there then just to get a flavor for it. Well, this is really interesting, isn't it? So let me share the results with you. So hopefully you can see that. Um, so 93% of you um, said that you're seeing less than 25% of patients remotely over video. So that's actually going to be quite a, a challenge, isn't it? Knowing that actually we're entering this um, domain where essentially everything uh, is going to be over remote consultations and they've already stipulated the majority being video. So I'm guessing most of you will be doing either over phone in terms of triage, which is not what the SCA is really about. It's not really about triage. And specifically, so, you know, majority of you have probably gone back to face to face, actually. Uh, a few more people just coming into the waiting room there. So I'm just going to let those guys in. So 99% face-to-face, 98% face-to-face, uh, Mariam and Saeed saying there, absolutely. What a strange era we're in, aren't we? The CSA was not a great exam, to be fair. 
um, you know, you had an examiner in the room, there was a lot of um, exam and performance anxiety, but I suppose that we were quite used to seeing patients uh, like that in that context, um, face to face. And yes, the examination didn't make a huge amount of um, impact in the context of you never ne needed to do a full examination in the CSA. But what we did know with the CSA is that about half the cases had a physical basis to them. That is to say, they were testing your diagnostic ability. And obviously, now that we're taking examination out of the SEA, that's not necessarily going to be a priority anymore, is it? So it's not an OSCE. That's a short it's standardized, but it's definitely not an OSCE. Um, so very important with every new exam that comes out. And obviously, I've been through all of them. You're going to hear a lot of messages coming out over the next few months, a lot of mixed messages. And you have to decide quite clearly what you want to believe because everyone's going to have an opinion about this. And tonight, hopefully, we can, together as a group, um, agree on a consensual opinion as to what this exam is actually looking for, how to best prepare for it, and actually dissecting a case apart. So hopefully that's going to be useful to you all. So the dates all commencing um, uh, in November nine sittings in 12 months goodness me we've never seen anything like that before you know so very very sort of busy exam lots of people going through it we've got the last rca sitting i appreciate some of you uh, tonight have taken the rca before and you're probably deciding do i go for the rca do i go for the sca it's a it's a very difficult one and you know i'm very happy to have that conversation uh, with you guys over email after tonight uh, once we've got through this webinar to see what might suit suit you best. I suppose, in a nutshell, with the RCA, you can't control what comes in through the door, but you can certainly control what you submit. Um, with the SCA, you also can't control what comes in through the door, but you can probably better prepare for it, in a sense, because obviously the cases are standardized. And when we start looking at the blueprint for case selection, that's where your strategy is going to come in. But I must reiterate, it's not an OSCE. Okay? Should we do another poll? Um, and just think about what this new assessment is going to actually be testing us on. Now, um, it's, a, uh, it's a slightly different poll um, because what we're going to be looking for here specifically is um, a couple of options. So some of you who might have just got your AKT uh, results today, hopefully that went well and don't mean to put you under AKT rules, but um, the poll I'm going to launch uh, we'll be looking at what the SAA is testing. It's a multiple choice and you have to pick two choices only, please. Okay, so here we go. <laughs> and she's very happy about AKT. I'm presuming you passed it, Anshu, hopefully, which is good. Okay, so what's the SAA testing? Pick two choices only. What do you think it's testing? Let's keep going. Let's keep going. So we're up to about 70% of people who've answered. Let's try and get up to about 90%. See what, uh, see what people think, really. Be great. About 87% of you have answered. Can we get it a little bit higher? Good, 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 good. good. Let's give it another 10 seconds. Yeah, we're heading that 90%. Oh, well done, Anshu. Results, results in your AKT. Fantastic. Okay. Good, good, good. Shall I end the poll and let's just have a look to see where we're at. Let me share the results. Okay, so hopefully you can all see that. So the majority of you have said that uh, the SEA is testing the management of patients and their narratives. You are absolutely spot on there, which basically means that their narratives will start in the case notes, which basically means you're going to get quite a lot of information in some of those case notes, which we're going to talk about in a second. Um, what's come in second here? So we've got uh, specifically risk management. Absolutely agree with that too. So actually, we aren't going to be able in these remote consultations um, go to the default position of sitting on the fence. And what do I mean by that? 
I mean, okay, so we'll bring you in, we'll do some investigations, and we'll see how it goes. We can't do that in the SCA. Oops. If you could just sorry, mute yourselves down, please. Thank you. Okay. Um, so we're not going to be able to sit on the fence. Okay. Uh, what else have people put here? Negotiation skills has come in next. Oh, yep, you've got that spot on. Absolutely. So about a third of you said negotiation skills. And then we've got clinical knowledge. And then actually diagnostic ability has come in a bit lower down. So actually, you guys have pretty much hit the nail on the head here. So this is not a diagnostic exam. And that's going to be quite interesting, isn't it? Because actually, if you pick up any um, sort of CSA book or um, uh, specifically any preparation books, and I'm, sh I'm sure there's going to be plenty that are coming out, they're all going to be diagnostic driven. And that's a very, very dangerous place to be. And we saw that also with the CSA. I mean, the CSA was a bit more diagnostic, but ultimately it was still narrative driven. A lot of books that made it into an OSCE. It's not an OSCE, guys. It's not an OSCE. Okay, you're not going to put hands on patients. You're not going to be examining patients in any way at all. So we really need to start thinking about actually what this is going to be testing us on. So what are the challenges of this? Well, it's not a tick box exercise, okay? You're going to be assessed on behavioral indicators. Behavioral indicators by default are quite subjective. It's not just about what you say, it's how you say it. And obviously, when you're nervous, how are you perceived to manage your uncertainty with confidence? That's a real skill um, because performance anxiety will kick in. Yes, the examiner's not there. That's, that's good. That's good. You know, we've got no one scrutinizing us. But with that said, if you're not used to remote consultations and you've, you've not sort of simulated that, then the first rule of thumb in passing this exam is to get pretty au fait with remote consultations. Okay? Both audio and remote video. And that, I suppose, is where now the power of study groups can come in. So when you're studying in your groups, which I'm sure you probably weren't able to do for the RCA, you're going to be able to do it now for the SCA, you really want to simulate that as best as possible. That is to say, you shouldn't necessarily be just sitting in a room face to face. Perhaps maybe, you know, you should set up a Zoom call in your study group where you can actually do this um, with, in a way that's going to be much more reflective and realistic of the SCA. OK, because engaging the patient over uh, an online platform is much more challenging than engaging them face to face. I'm sure you're aware of that already because a lot of that is to do with transference and transference isn't just about what you say it's about how you say it and that depends on that kind of energy and we all know how difficult it is to maintain virtual energy i mean you know i'm looking at about you know 70 blank screens at the moment okay so you know at this point in time it's not easy to maintain that virtual energy but you're going to have to do that obviously 12 times over and it has to feel real so these are meant to reflect real life presentations, but it won't be a typical clinic because in a typical clinic, if it's remote, a lot of that will often be triage and thinking about actually not making a decision until the patient comes in to your room so you can examine them and make a decision then. None of these consultations will be built in that way. That is to say there is a defined endpoint with all of these remote consultations. And that's a really important thing to remember. You cannot sit on the fence with these consultations. A decision has to be made. You're going to need time for this. You know, my registrars, if we're looking at the old CSA, I would never let any of my registrars at St. Mary's take the CSA until they've had at least six months experience of, of NHS GP practice. That doesn't necessarily mean, you know, as an ST3, you could be right now an ST2 in general practice. So you you're getting pretty au fait, you're getting pretty confident. Um, but if you're someone who's just going into SD3 and you, you, know, you haven't had much sort of GP experience prior to that, please don't sit this exam you? prematurely. Please, can you mute yourselves down, please? It's not a cot, okay? So cots are formative. This is very much summative. And although you've got 12 minutes, 12 minutes goes quickly. Now, if any of you've watched some of the example um, SCA videos that are on the RCGP website, which were published um, 
in the last week or so, they're very interesting because 12 minutes goes actually very, very quickly on a remote consultation. So this aspect of making it focused is key. It's not just a chat, okay? And you do have to see it as a game of two halves where you are actually driving that consultation forward. The analogy is very much like a car journey, all right? So you're the driver, your passenger, your patient is right next to you, but what you need to recognize is that journey may have already started off. That is to say, you're coming in to that car journey a little bit later. That journey may have been driven by another GP, and that means looking at the case notes is going to be absolutely key. You will not be able to just sit on the fence and say, I really don't know what's going on. Let's do some investigations, bring you in, and then we'll make a plan. That's not going to happen. And unfortunately, you can't go for a nice little stroll, okay, and say, well, let's see you in a couple of weeks and see how it goes, okay? Now, that's real-life general practice, isn't it? So although the consultations that are coming in to the SCA are real life, they're not necessarily typical because every consultation will have an endpoint. So knowing, for example, where you are, if the case is looking at going through some results or investigations, you need to look at the notes and understand what has happened before. And you will have three minutes to do that. And we're going to play a little memory game this evening, okay? Because we're going to look at an RCGP case uh, in terms of an SCA case published on the website. And we're going to do what I call a deep dive into this. Now, I've already run a few trainers' workshops. I'll be running trainer and VTS workshops nationally for the SCA quite soon, um, really looking at how we deep dive into some of these SCA cases and then looking at the right consultation strategy uh, around it. So right now, I'm sure some of you are feeling, oh, you know, it's going to be like the surgery from hell. But I would encourage you to think more like this, okay? It's going to be a challenging clinic, but it will be a very interesting clinic. And it's very important we think about that because ultimately, the only person who can make a difference necessarily in this is you. You're going to be the drug in this consultation, and that's really, really important. Um, again, remember, transference is the key. You can only make a patient feel better depending on how you make them feel, and that starts with you. How do you feel? If you're very nervous and anxious, that transmission is going to come across very quickly remotely, be it audio or video. Okay, so... What have we got? We've got all remote consultations. They've said so far that the majority will be video uh, with some audio, 12 by 12 minutes with a three minute gap in between. And specifically in those three minutes, you get to read the case notes. It's all on one screen. So a couple of days ago, um, the RCGP published a, an introduction, a very short introductory video to the SCA. In fact, that uh, that video was filmed in one of my training practices uh, at St. Mary's. So um, I knew that was going to be coming out quite soon. And it's quite interesting when you look at it because there's a lot of information that's going to be coming at you. It's very different. So for those of you, again, who've done the AKT uh, recently, you know, doing an online paper is so very different from doing, you know, something where you've got hard copies in front of you. So actually, it's going to be testing a lot of visual spatial awareness and how you digest that information quickly. And that's why we're going to play this memory game in a second. Now, it's not a typical clinic because guess what? In a typical clinic, you probably won't have in general practice, real life general practice, uh, consultations with social workers, other allied healthcare professionals. You will do in the RCA possibly, and it's very important to, to prepare for that. Okay, each case is marked by a different examiner. Uh, no cases will require physical examination. Therefore, it cannot really be an exam that is diagnostically driven if actually we're taking the physical examination out of it. That's going to specifically now be assessed in the work-based placed um, assessment. And then an overall aggregate mark. Now, we don't know quite how that pass mark is going to be determined. I'll talk a little bit more in detail. So, you know, no doubt I'll be running many more of these uh, SCA webinars as the information evolves. Um, so Lucy here is asked specifically about, do I know anything about reasonable adjustments at this point? And, and the answer to that is I don't, Lucy. Um, so 
you know, we just need to keep an eye on this space as information is uh, released. So right now, in terms of reasonable adjustments, if we look at um, the CSA or specifically the RCA, you know, with the RCA, if you've got a mitigating circumstance, um, then actually the recording time was extended to 15 minutes. That was actually never the case for the CSA, to be fair. Um, for the CSA, it was still 10 minutes, but you had a bit more time to look at the case notes. So we don't know what's going to happen at this point. I think it would be very difficult to, to specifically run a um, SCA where all the timings changed to 15 minutes, but we have to watch this space. Right, so we know then um, that this is not a diagnostic driven exam. So what is it going to be testing you guys on? And so we need to now look at the blueprint, because if we understand the blueprint, then we can start focusing strategically on presentations that might fit this blueprint. So let's have a quick look at this. So a patient less than 19 years old. All right, so you're going to get actors who will play teenagers. All right. Gender, reproductive and sexual health. Long term condition, including cancer, multimorbidity and disability. Older adults, including frailty and end of life. Mental health, including addiction, smoking, alcohol and substance abuse. So again, you know, would you necessarily be submitting these sorts of cases for the RCA? They're tough cases. They're quite high challenge cases. So you probably, you know, you know, in the RCA, you'd be showcasing to your strengths. Whereas this kind of stuff now, you know, patients who perhaps are coming in because they are adamant to have a, a benzodiazepine, something which has got an addiction potential. They want that from you and you don't want to give it. So actually, that's going to start testing those negotiation skills, urgent and unscheduled care. So we started to talk about risk management. Can you recognize what's serious? Can you recognize how quickly you might have to escalate something? Health disadvantage and vulnerabilities, including mental capacity, safeguarding. That's really interesting. Isn't it? Safeguarding. That's never really appeared in the CSA. It's, you know, and again, with the RCA, you don't necessarily have to showcase that. You have to showcase that, obviously, as an ST1, ST2 and ST3 at every ARCP. You've got to showcase safeguarding uh, level three for adult and child. Um, so, you know, as an ARCP chair for HE London, that's something that we always look at. Communication difficulties, ethnicity, culture, diversity, inclusivity, new presentation of undifferentiated disease. So I suppose that's where your diagnostic ability comes in. But again, that's only one clinical experience group out of many prescribing so actually you know that's not really featured that heavily before in the context of you know CSA um, obviously in the RCA it does feature if you're going to prescribe something but now you're actively going to be tested on this if the case de uh, deems it to be going through investigation and results so again this was something that never really sort of featured much in the RCA. If you look at the RCA criteria, they sort of said, you know, avoid follow ups, avoid going through results because it doesn't really allow you to meet those other capabilities. But now we see it feature here. Um, professional conversation, professional dilemma. That's interesting, isn't it? So actually, are you going to be having a conversation with an allied healthcare professional who maybe isn't agreeing with your plan or maybe you don't agree with their plan of action? How do you start working through that aspect? OK, so let's have a look at this case. Uh, so Jimmy says, do you still have to state you do a certain physical examination? No, because you won't be examined on that. I mean, if you're obviously bringing the patient in to do an examination, you still have to have a differential in mind and why you're doing that examination. But you won't be able to hide behind a physical examination before you make a commitment. So if you are simply saying, I'll do the examination, I really can't commit to anything at this point, then you're not actually committing to a management plan at all. No, so it's no. not really like the RCA in that sense. Okay, so should we do a quick memory game in a sense? Um, this is a RCA, SCA case rather, sorry, SCA case uh, that was put up on the RCGP website. So let's read through it together. And I want to see if you can actually recall this information a bit later on, because we're going to do a deep dive into this. And the reason I'm going to ask you to try and recall it is because when you're consulting with the patient, you're going to have this information alongside. But can you actually sort of flip between this and that 
and still consult with the patient in real time. So candidate briefing, this is a telephone consultation. The role player will not be visible. So it's not a video uh, consultation, it's an audio one, okay? We've received an email from the district community nurse today. I've just seen Mr. McLean as part of my routine visit to see his wife. He's had diarrhea for the past few days and we've been given examination findings. So in answer to Jiman's question here, I'm not doing a physical examination because I've actually already got my examination findings. Uh, he's afebrile, dry tongue, abdomen soft and non-tender. I've got two blood pressures, a sitting and a standing. All other findings are normal. I've got a BM and I've got a urine analysis. I've asked him to give you a call as he wasn't his normal happy self. That's your briefing. Okay, try and remember it. Now, can you remember this? So, the case notes that come with it. Oh, blimey, look at that. That's quite a lot of information, isn't it? To digest, to recall, you've got three minutes before that patient consults with you. So I've got a patient who's 75. He's got a past medical history of type 2 diabetes and essential hypertension diagnosed 10 years ago. He's the main carer for his wife who's got dementia. Medication wise is on metformin. He's on 500 milligram tablets. Two of those, so a gram BD, candostatin eight milligrams once a day and a Torva 20 once a day. And we have his last consultation from the uh, diabetic clinic at the practice. He was doing well with no symptoms. Retinal screening was normal, foot check normal, blood pressure stable. Do we remember what his blood pressure was today? Was it higher than that? Was it lower than that? Was there a postural drop? 146 over 82, routine bloods, electrolytes normal, EGFR 55, CKD stage 3. It's been at this around two years, HbA1c 53, liver function test, cholesterol normal, plan is to continue medication. So just take 10 seconds to reflect on that and we're going to play a little memory game when we do a deep dive into this consultation a bit later. Okay, so how are these cases written up? So remember that in the RCA, patients, of course, will talk and talk and talk. Okay, so, you know, the whole point with the RCA is that patients will not necessarily respect your golden minute. You know, they will go well over that. Whereas in the SCA, that's never going to be the case because we have to know that you are actively extracting that information from the patient. So I've been involved in case writing for probably about 22 years for various different faculties and exams. And whenever we give a detailed script to a role player, it's split into two parts, information which is freely divulged and then everything else is you don't ask, you don't get. And if you don't believe me, all you need to do is watch some of these RCGP videos where, you know, the ST goes, any other symptoms? And the patient goes, like what? So it's very important that actually we start thinking about focused symptoms in context to what the patient is presenting with. So it's going to be about your technique. Um, the CSA had a bank of around 600 plus cases, so we anticipate the SCA will be very similar. And no doubt some of the CSA cases that we used before will be adapted for remote consultations, but you're not going to pass by regurgitating a case because it's not diagnostic driven. That's the whole point. It's narrative, narrative driven. So a few um, questions here. Uh, Lucy asks, will we be able to jot down notes? Well, you'll be in your own practice. So yes, I'm sure you, you will be able to. I guess the what hasn't been clarified is what you will have access to. So in the CSA, you had to bring in your BNF. Um, there's still questions as to who's adjudicating this. Is this going to be your trainer? I mean, will you, have, will you have access to online resources? You know, what will you actually have access to? It has to be 
absolutely clarified. Um, Freha, Freha asks, do we have this prompt case on our side to read? Yes, you do, but it's only on one screen. So the question is, how, where are you going to focus your attention? You've got three minutes to read it, and then your patient comes on. Um, so specifically, are you going to just be looking at the notes, or are you going to be engaging with your patient at that point in time? So again, preparing for that is very, very important. Should we have a look at the marking schedule? So when you start looking at the marking schedule, this is really expansive. It's much more expansive than anything we have ever seen for any previous exam. I took the old MRCGP. There were only 16 criteria, only 16. And then with the CSA expanded a bit, with the RCA expanded a bit more. But now with the SCA, it's pretty huge, to be fair. And what's very interesting is that the marking schedule focuses specifically on competencies that are not met. So three domains, okay, the domains remain much the same as they did for the CSA and the RCA. We've got data gathering, but now the diagnosis moves into data gathering, okay. So previously the diagnosis resided in the clinical management competency of the RCA. Clinical management now encompasses medical complexity. And from an interpersonal perspective, it now has been renamed as relating to others. The domains are going to be weighted according to the nature of the case. So I don't at this point have the details of the exact marking scheme for the domains. I'm sure that will come through over summer. Um, but what we're going to do is postulate a little bit. Um, and I'll be using my experience with the previous exams just to tell you my flavor for where we're going with this. But it is expected that the clinical management domain will probably carry the most weighting out of the three. Okay. There are four grades awardable, a clear pass, to a clear fail for each domain. Now, if we look at the CSA and the RCA, um, a clear pass uh, equated to a mark of three and a clear fail was zero. So we don't know whether that's still gonna be the case for the SCA, but no doubt um, there will be some mark aggregation because they're gonna have to be able to give an objective mark uh, at the end of the day. The examiner will also rate you overall as pass, bare pass, bare fail, or fail. Um, in the CSA, there was also a serious concerns box that was used if uh, something dangerous had been undertaken. Again, uh, we're gonna see if that features in the SCA. And then the pass mark for each sitting is gonna be determined by the borderline group method. So there will be a pass mark for each sitting as there has been for the CSA and for the RCA. So currently the RCA pass marks about 142 to 143. Feedback will be case specific. That's good. In fact, it was case specific anyway for the CSA. For the RCA, it's not case specific, as you're probably aware. And it will be linked to the marking domains and then released to your 14 fish e-portfolio. Right, so the RCA mark sheet, uh, one that I designed, looks a bit like this. There were global indicators, and this um, really maps to the feedback statements for the RCA. Um, specifically, we had poor choice of consultation. Obviously, that's never going to feature now in the standardized exam. Shall we have a look at what um, potentially an SCA mark sheet might look like? Now, don't get too shocked, guys, because I asked you to print this out anyway, so you should have a copy in front of you. But it is much, much more extensive, as you can see. And this really does reflect the additional marking statements that have been introduced. Given that uh, I'm such a dinosaur, and when I did the old MRCGP, which was about 21 years ago, there were only 16 statements overall, you can see how expansive this is. So just take a bit of time to digest this. If you haven't got this mark sheet in front of you, I did send you the link, it would be really good for you to have it in front of you when we do our deep dive into our um, SCA case in a second. So do you make sure you've got it in front of you? Let's go through them in a bit more detail then. So data gathering was unsystematic and disorganized. Well, that featured in the um, CSA and the RCA. Data gathering was incomplete or ins insufficiently targeted to ensure patient safety. That's really interesting because what that is implying is that by the end of your data gathering, you should be able to commit to risk. You shouldn't have to depend 
necessarily on an examination or any investigation before you're committing to risk. This is very, very important. So one of the big reasons that, pe that people have failed the RCA is because they've not primed the case, they've not used what was already in the patient's notes, therefore wasting far too much time in data gathering and not giving themselves enough time to get into the clinical management section. After tonight, please go away and watch some of these videos and make a judgment yourself as to whether the ST has used the existing information effectively, accurately, in context, and most importantly, promptly. In some of these RCA, I keep saying RCA, I beg your pardon, SCA videos that have been put out on the RCGP website, some of the STs don't reference the information at all, and it is to their detriment. So do please go away and have a look at some of these videos and have a look at this competency. Relevant red flags were not considered. Psychological or social information to place the problem in context were incompletely identified. Insufficient generation of functional solutions for data gathering when presented with multiple and complex problems. So some of these cases are going to be quite multi-layered. We'll go back to our deep dive, Steve uh, McLean, in a second to see if that might be the case for him. Implications of abnormal findings or results were not fully recognized or understood. Reasonable working hypotheses were incomplete. Therefore, you cannot rely on your examination, which we know is not going to feature, or indeed investigations. You have to commit to something. So that's really, really key. So that's the data gathering. Okay. Okay, let's have a look at the next one. So clinical management, medical um, complexity, reasons for failing. The management plan was not reflective of current best practice. Okay, well, that's the same for the CSA and the RCA, so no big deal there. Incomplete management plan. Okay, so you've got to get to point B as best as you can. Now, this is important, isn't it? Because this hasn't featured before. Inappropriate or untargeted investigations were selected to manage the condition. We've all done OSCEs before. I've been a senior OSCE examiner uh, for many years. When I say to my students, you know, what investigations are you going to do? I say, don't tell me. I already know what you're going to say. Full blood count. That's what you're going to say, aren't you? And they go, yeah, how do you know, Dr. Gim? It's like, that's what everyone says. But why are you going to do a full blood count? Why is that appropriate? Oh, because this patient might be anemic. No, why would this patient be anemic? So it's really, really important that you recognize you're being assessed essentially on the use of resources. Okay, budgetary governance is going to feature quite heavily. The prescribing of medications was not effective. Current guidelines of best practice, well, that featured in both the uh, CSA and also the RCA. And then here we go, budgetary governance, inappropriate resources selected. We are not looking for doctors who are risk averse. We are looking for GPs who know how to contain risk when risk needs to be contained and can escalate it in context appropriately. Inappropriate or insufficient use of time as a management tool. So that's when you're containing risk. So again, not having that knee jerk response to just do that investigation or refer on, but actually containing that risk. Inadequate arrangements for safe and sensible follow up, continuity and safety netting, well that featured in both exams before. Management options were unresponsive to circumstances, that's where your risk management's coming in, and preferences of those involved. But are you someone who's patient driven, or are you going to be patient centered? Are you just going to do what the patient wants you to do? Or are you going to actually recognize potentially there's a dilemma there and that station is testing you on negotiation? So here's your risk coming in again. Number nine, management options were unprioritized in regards to perceived risk, insufficient evidence of coherent management plans for complexity and multiple issues, health promotion, which is featured before. So 11 competencies there in that clinical management. And then relating to others, we have seen a huge expansion here of the interpersonal domain. Personal and cultural differences, if appropriate, were not acknowledged or recognized. Inappropriate or insufficient demonstration of respect and sensitivity during the consultation. Judgmental in an approach, that's never come in before. 
judgmental in approach. It's quite interesting, isn't it? Because actually, I don't think any of us go into um, medicine as a doctor wanting to be judgmental. But it's not just necessarily what we say, it's how we say it. You know, how often, perhaps, you know, when you ask someone whether they smoke and they go, I don't smoke, and you go, oh, that's really good. Is it? <laughs> okay, so if I was a smoker, would that be really bad? So you have to be careful with your use of words, okay? I mean, you know, if you've got a smoker who's given up, that's really good, but I'm not a good or bad person according to whether I smoke or don't smoke. So again, you know, words, not just what we say, but how we say them are going to have quite a big impact. The patient's autonomy, best interests were only partially considered or disregarded. So are you someone who's very doctor driven? Are you just chasing for that diagnosis? Now, this is an interesting one. The insufficient awareness and understanding of the medical legal implications involved. Medical legal? I've never seen that in any exam, the CSA or indeed the RCA. So again, you know, that's featured as a competency, insufficient exploration of the patient's agenda, health beliefs and preferences, insufficient evidence of active listening, verbal, nonverbal communication skills. So thinking about picking up those cues, explanations were insufficiently adapted to the patient's context and level of understanding, and the management plan was insufficiently shared for the patient to understand what they needed to do or the next course of action. Ineffective teamwork, that's interesting, isn't it? We haven't seen that one before. Ineffective teamwork, understanding of others' roles. So again, are you someone who's not necessarily aware of the things that you can use within your own practice to contain risk? Are we using those team members, delegating effectively the impact of the problem on the patient? And look at this, and all the family. That's never come in before. So again, managing patients' narratives, the situation as opposed to just the diagnosis. Negotiation skills, that's never featured before, particularly heavily. Inadequate ownership of any decisions made. So actually, are you committing to that management plan yourself or are you just um, escalating it unnecessarily? Again, safeguarding, fascinating, isn't it? So this is a very, very different beast from what we've seen before. It's not the CSA. It's not the RCA. It's very, very different. So, should we do a deep dive? We've got about 15 minutes left, and I think it's really important we have a constructive discussion about this deep dive of that uh, RCA case. You should have the marking competencies in front of you. Let's firstly think about, I suppose, a few skills. And I'll be talking more about my consultation strategy in future webinars, but I think one of the things to recognize is we've seen just from the marking competencies and especially relating to others. That actually, if you're going to open up ice, you best use it, use it to focus your history and then readdress it. But it's also very important that the I comes before the C and it comes before the E. Ice is not a question just to be asked formulaically. It's about truly understanding where a patient's coming from. So often in real life, actually, patients will give you their ice quite freely in that first golden minute. And all you need to do is acknowledge it. You don't want to over ice anybody. You're not going to get a tick for that. It doesn't work that way. OK, if it's volunteered, then what you want to do is actually acknowledge it and use it to focus. If a patient's saying from the outset they're concerned about their headache, what is it that concerns them? Did they have a particular worry as to potentially what might be causing it? And did they have any thoughts today when they made the appointment as to how they want things taken forward? But it's about using it. If that patient is worried about a brain tumour, then consider how you're going to use that health anxiety to focus down on the neurological red flags of the presenting symptom to validate your decision making. Because if you don't take a tight enough history, then you won't be able to commit to risk. So if you elicit ICE, there's only two other rules. Use it and then readdress it. Negotiation skills. It's always about hearing and seeing where the patient's coming from. It's about recognizing that actually saying, I'm sorry. Well, you're not actually. 
as opposed to what well, I can hear why you're concerned and I'm sorry to hear about that concern is very different from just saying I'm sorry. But it's also about what you can do to try and help. So this aspect of transference of energy is going to be so key when it comes to these virtual consultations. It's so important that if we elicit the agenda, we actually address the agenda. And if we can't meet the agenda, then we verbalize why we can't. It's about verbalizing and sharing the dilemma. That patient who's insistent on getting Zopiclone again, why is it that we have a dilemma around that? And that means going back to the ethics of beneficence, malnificence, but it's also about trying to manage that situation and defining those professional boundaries because we've seen those medical legal implications come in. Seeing a patient, for example, who's coming to see you remotely because they've had a first time fit and they're still driving. You know, what is the dilemma there and how do we depersonalize that? It's not me saying you can't drive, it's the DVLA. So if we do negotiate, again, these are skills you're gonna have to get up to scratch with before you take the SCA. And if you have a look at a lot of the videos that are up there already on that RCGP website, they are testing negotiation skills. And what you want to be doing is watching those videos thinking, mm, did that SD actually truly negotiate well? Because if you say no to something, you're going to have to have something in the other hand to barter with. Yeah. And those stations will be designed such that there is something that you can barter with. So this aspect of energy, okay, is key. You know, when you're seeing a patient face to face, the best thing is when you look them in the eye, right? The eyes tell you everything. You smile with your eyes, yeah? It's not going to be so easy to do that necessarily in the SCA, but that's something that we can all still practice. So really important that we get into the right modality around this. All right, do you remember this one? Let's do this deep dive. We've got about 10 minutes left. So that's the email from the district community nurse. Those are the case notes. Let's do a deep dive now. What do you think that case potentially might be testing you on? Oops. In the chat group. So you had the case notes, so older adults, potentially. What else? You had all the case notes. Urgent unscheduled care. Four, six, seven. Ten. Okay, so we've got a lot of people obviously going for older adults, which I absolutely agree with. Urgent unscheduled care, okay. Why? Because potentially this patient might be actually someone who is more unwell, although at face value, that doesn't look to necessarily be the case with the examination findings that we've got. So the examination findings looked potentially stable. But again, that's something that we need to think about. You know, is that something that we need to risk escalate? Um, and a number of you have put prescribing. I agree with that a lot. Why did we put prescribing down? Give me some thoughts there. I absolutely agree with prescribing big time. Why? And this is now the three minutes before we're seeing the patient. You were given the case notes. You were given the examination. So Janica, thank you. So metformin candestatin, they got diarrhea, sick day rules, potential AKI risk and lactic acidosis. So for me, prescribing is quite big up there. That's definitely something that I need to be thinking about. I don't want to just box myself in. It's just about having a game plan. Okay, I've got this older adult. Uh, what else? What else came out in there? What else is in that story? Think about the situation. Carer, carer, okay. So, if we're saying that he's unwell and he's the main carer for his wife and we're looking at urgent and unscheduled care, what do you think the challenge might be there? The wife would need care, which basically means we have, and I love this word, the word dilemma, don't we? 
You see, the word dilemma featured so heavily in the CSA uh, for about three or four stations because they really tested your negotiation skills. Absolutely. So now we're seeing these negotiation skills come in. Uh, so health disadvantage, vulnerabilities, mental capacity, safeguarding, communication difficulties. Yes or no, I'm not sure. That for me is probably a bit lower down. I think for me, it's going to definitely be around prescribing. It's going to be around older adults. It's going to be potentially around urgent unscheduled care. Potentially it's going to be about having a dilemma. We might have to have professional conversation with the district nurse if we're trying to risk contain it. So you can see now that that case, even before the patients come in, you can see the constructs of that case, the blueprint of that case, and potentially how that case may have been written up, which is actually really, really important. So, we had that information, okay? There's a lot of information there already about how the patient is, their medication. So ineffective use of existing information to assist a safe assessment. After tonight, please go and watch this video, which is on the RCGP website. And try and be objective now in how you mark it. OK, because you can't pass this exam just by being nice. You've got to have a game plan. It's really, really important. And then specifically now, management options were unresponsive to circumstances. So what did the patient want? They're a carer for his wife, you know? Maybe he can't just come in to see us. You know, he had a postural drop. We already, what else, what else? Let's test your memory. What else did you remember from those case notes? So you saw that postural drop, you saw the medications. Anything else that you remembered from the information in the notes? Dry tongue, he was dehydrated, he got CKD, okay? So he's, he's, he's volume depleted and he's got CKD, he was in stage three CKD. And he's on those drugs that obviously affect renal function. So, you know, that's really important, isn't it? Really, really important. So, you know, all that information. So imagine, like, you, you, you know, maybe you've had a station that didn't go so well. And then suddenly you've got three minutes to read all those notes. And suddenly the patient's in there and you're trying to focus on those notes. And you're trying to focus on that patient. It's not easy. You know, this takes practice. This is, a, this is a very different sort of exam. So just important, you know, that's why I just want to play that little memory game there, just to start thinking about actually, when we've got those three minutes, what are the sentinel pieces of information that we're going to use in that first domain, the existing information to help us move forwards, to help us get into that second, um, that second half, okay? The patient's autonomy, Best interests are only partially considered or disregarded. So again, that patient saying, you know, maybe I don't want to come in. I've you know, got to look after my wife. So then we've got to start thinking about, you know, that negotiation, how we showcase that. Can we maybe use the district nurse to help us contain that risk? So, um, you know, that delegation. So Mohammed's talked about respite community matron. Well, they already know to the district nurse, but yeah, absolutely. So I like this. So main, Melissa says, may negotiation would be to go to hospital. Wife's got dementia. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. Good, so now you're beginning to really think about this much more from a narrative point of view, aren't you? I mean, we didn't even talk about the diagnosis. <laughs> you know, what was the diagnosis? I don't know what the diagnosis, maybe it's gastroenteritis. I don't know, but you know, there's so much more to this already, as you can see. You know, we were given that information for a reason, okay? To move us away from just chasing the diagnosis. And that's how this exam is gonna be. So, um, a few pointers, okay. Firstly, we've done that deep dive. Hopefully you found that useful, but is there any helpful information in the case notes? We've done that now, that's great. So when you look on the college website, they specifically talked about the, you know, the difference in blood pressure readings in the case notes. Is this significant? What should be done? Some of you mentioned um, AKI, fantastic, fantastic. So yeah, brilliant. Now you're beginning to really sort of think about, you know, what the exam might be testing you on. Do you suspect a diagnosis of gastroenteritis? Well, I don't know, because we haven't actually started the consultation yet. So again, when you watch the video, do have a look at it and think, you know, is this gastroenteritis um, or is this something potentially more serious? Is there a need for further examination investigation? If so, what is the urgency of organizing these? What do you, what do you guys think about that? 
I mean, we haven't obviously seen the consultation, but he, uh, Namisha said his blood pressure was low today. We know he's dehydrated. He's got that postural drop. What, what do people think? I think he needs bloods. Yeah, I do think he needs bloods, Nature. Yeah, I think I would agree. I mean, you know, the last uh, checkup was some time ago. We do probably need to look at his renal function. You know, again, it would be in the context of the consultation that we're taking, but he, he probably does need um, some uh, up-to-date investigations. Uh, Nature's talked about maybe stopping the, the metformin and candestatin. Let's see what the college said. Oh, there we go. So, yeah, depending on what has been said in context maybe we need to stop those for the moment um let's just have a look has anyone else joined no, that's fine. and then what management steps would you suggest now so again we've started to talk about the, the medication maybe we need to see this patient depending on you know if there's been any other sort of additional red flags that we've kind of picked up on do we actually need to bring the patient in or if they can't actually come in, should we be going to see them? Again, so that extra community support. Good. Review. Once the blood's prescribing adjusted. I love it. Well done, Anshu. Yeah, good. And then actually, what does a patient want today from us? You know? And that's so important because I think for me, um, you know, having seen pretty much every assessment under the sun um, with the MRCGP, it's important to understand that when patients come to see us, they've got concerns, right? So it's in our interests, surely, to listen to those concerns and open up their eyes earlier so that we can actually address it. Because as you can see from the relating to others competency marks, that features very very heavily. So if you're asking ice only at like eight minutes, it's a bit late because you're not going to be able to use it very much at that point and then readdress it in time. So probably what you want to do is think about how you open up ice in context a little bit earlier. And then flexible solutions. Some of you've mentioned these already in the context of additional community support. So well done. So we've done a really good deep dive and that's before we've even seen the patient, you know? So that's, I think, very useful. When you start looking at these cases, think to yourself, why am I being given this information? Now, I don't want you to overthink it. You know, the worst thing to, you can do is completely overthink it and clutter your brain. But you should have a game plan. You should have a strategy. You start thinking about the SCA blueprint. You start thinking about all those competencies um, that we talked about. So, um, we're gearing up for this now. Um, so I've been teaching and running MRCGP courses for a good 20 years or so now. Uh, all of them, the old MRCGP, the CSA, the RCA, and have been really spending the last uh, few months getting ready for this new exam. Uh, I've got some really good challenging cases which will showcase uh, these clinical experience groups showcase all these competencies um, and really get your consultation skills up to scratch. So we're going to be starting to run these flagship courses really from the end of July um, onwards and specifically um, it's going to be limited to six active participants and we'll be taking a few observers on depending on um, you know the demand but if you can come on as an active it'll be the best thing you'll be able to record your feedback and we'll be doing three rounds of simulated surgery um, with case marking and feedback uh, recorded. So this is just an example case um, and uh, I'm going to be running some of these uh, on VTS workshops very, very soon just to calibrate. Um, so do keep an eye on your email. Um, I'll be sending out uh, some information around that do keep an eye out on the RCGP for the SCA uh, updates. Um, there are some of their own uh, webinars coming out, but uh, they'll be coming out later in, in June. Um, and I'll be running another uh, webinar on my own consultation strategy. Um, again, it's going to be limited in numbers, so if you want to sign up to it, if you found this one useful, um, then do put your interests in when you receive that email. 
And then we'll be developing specifically when I've got more information about how the essay is marked. We're going to be developing a very specific marking webinar, which will run alongside the uh, one day flagship course. In addition, I'm developing an online bank of remote consultations, which are simulated with my CSA role players who I've worked with now for about uh, 15 odd years. Um, lots of resources on the website. Uh, mentormededucation.com. In fact, one of my role players hopefully is going to be signing on just in a second just to introduce herself so that she can uh, talk a little bit about what it is that we do. Let me just have a look to see if there are any questions here. So um, I think I saw a few comments about will we have to document notes as we would do in real life? No. No, although I think you'll have the opportunity to record, uh, to write some notes down and have a scratch pad as we did in the uh, CSA. Um, let's have a look, see. Uh, best way to contact me. Um, uh, so it's going to be through email, um, mrcgpcourses at yahoo.com. Um, I have put my WhatsApp number uh, on the website now. I don't run a WhatsApp group though. Um, I think Rahira was asking about that. I don't want to, I don't run a WhatsApp group, but I, I do have WhatsApp if you want to contact me. Does it matter if flexible solutions might be local and not national services? Um, we have a local rapid access frailty team. It's meant to really reflect your local practice. So that's absolutely fine. The only time where I think it will come into play is when basically you are prescribing. So if your prescribing doesn't mirror national guidance, um, then that's where it's going to be taken apart a little bit. But if you've got, you know, an in-house physio, if you've got, you know, services that are local to your practice, then by all means, um, you should be using them. Okay, any other questions at all or comments about what we've done tonight? So Facebook support group is actually a really good way to stay in touch. If you guys use Facebook, I'm not, I mean, I'm not huge on social media to be fair, but that's the most um, um, active um, and we've got a really nice little group going. So if you haven't signed up to the Facebook support group, then, you know, do come on. And also we've got um, the YouTube channel. So if you haven't subscribed to that, do have a look. So I'm hopefully going to get this webinar up there if you want to revisit it. Um, then do have that. Okay, so uh, Lauren's asked a really, really good question, which I'm going to answer in a second, and I'll be around for five more minutes just to take any sort of further questions. Um, okay, let me just stop the share so that I can have a look at the questions. Okay, so the case example that uh, we just saw, it fit into many categories. Will be there one case for each of the 12 categories? Or will they mostly overlap like this one? So when you have a look at the examples on the RCGP website, the SEA cases overlap. Um, so some, most of them take out two or three categories, um, at least two in any case. So it's not likely just to be one. I mean, if we have a look, for example, at, um, so just taking Lauren's question a little bit further. If we have a look, for example, at uh, the... Uh, patient who's under 19 years old, what um, sort of case might you think uh, would be a good SCA case that could overlap other categories? So we're looking at the kind of teenager type case. So safeguarding, contraception, excellent, excellent. Eating disorder, so it could be mental health, it could be sexual health, contraception, which then takes us into safeguarding, which then takes us into medical legal complications. Absolutely. Absolutely. So where in the RCGP website uh, do we see the... So when they say... So the first thing to say is they are not exemplary videos. They're not exemplary. They're just videos. And the RCGP specifically say these are not like... You're just meant to look at them and make your own judgment. They're not exemplary. They're example videos, but they're not exemplary videos. Um, so when you type in RCGP SCA and you get to the SCA website, um, 
specifically uh, when you go down, it, it, there's a section where they talk about obviously the videos. And when you click on that, there's about six videos there. Thanks, Lauren. So I think um, Louise is on here. So I'm just going to ask her to switch on her video just so she can give a quick introduction. She's just joined us. So Louise, are you there? No, I don't see you. Oh, maybe she's not. Hello, can, can you hear me? Oh, hi there. Hi. Hi. Well, Louise, Louise is labelled as Joe, so I'm just going to relabel. <laughs> okay. Oh, sorry, I didn't hear you then. Uh, hi, Louise. Can you hear us hi. now? Yeah. So um, I've got Louise Mercier here, who's uh, one of my amazing role players, and uh, just going to talk a little bit about what we actually do on the course. So we were just talking about a case, Louise, around a teenager and contraception and why this makes for such a good case. Um, do tell them a little bit about what we do on the course, see if they would find it helpful. Yeah, so, I mean, I've been, just a bit about my background, I've been working for Nigel now on all of the courses I think he's ran that involve a simulated patient. Um, so that's been for many moons, just in terms of a, a bit of background of my experience. I've been working in um, as a simulated patient in medical role play. I was just trying to figure it out then. I reckon for since about 2008, 2007, so a long time. <laughs> and so, uh, and I've worked in different capacities with different um, medical professionals and clinicians. Um, right across the board um, and uh, and across all of Nigel's courses so from when it was the CSA the RCA the you know all of all of the courses so this will be an interesting one um, I think there are some differences in terms of what is being looked at and what is being assessed and particularly communications uh, communication uh, wise um, and in terms of what you will get from an actor, um, obviously the RCA was very much real life. You're submitting real scenarios and your patients are gonna give you a lot of information. I think the CSA, along with this current uh, system, this new exam, um, you, you'll be obviously be working with actors. So there is, there will be less that you get freely given. And I think um, certainly with the CSA, there was a very much a case of, um, you know, as you would as a GP asking, is there anything else you want to tell me? A, a real life patient might say, yes, this, 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 and this, and this, and this, and this. Whereas as an actor, we will say, well, we're like, what, what do you mean specifically? Um, and then it's going to be a bit of a back and forth between the GP then saying, or the doctor, the candidate saying, or is it, what do you think I should do? And then us as the actor going, well, what do you think? I think you should know, you know, there's a lot of kind of, of that of fishing for those kind of answers that the actor simply can't give you information as freely as a patient would um so that's something to bear in mind um would be a little tip i think a, a similarity between the, the course that that will now be taking place uh, the exam sorry that will now be taking place and the csa um so that will be that will be similar obviously doing it uh um electronically uh via zoom or whatever is similar to the RCA, uh, of course. Um, but yeah, that's something to bear in mind. Um, obviously, we as actors are trained to be simulated patients. So we don't just say whatever. We don't just say, say whatever comes out of our mouth. We, are, we have to adhere to a script um, and we will only give you information. We have in our scripts, we're told to only give information if specifically asked. So that's something to bear in mind. It's, it is different. I mean, the fundamentals are the same in terms of, sorry, I've got Peppa Pig in the background, my little girl. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was trying to get her down to sleep and she was just fighting me. So apologies if you can hear a bit of Peppa Pig in the background. Um, that would be a real patient moment there. But, <laughs> um, but yeah, so I think, uh, what was I saying along the lines of, um, but yeah, some, there's some fundamental similarities in terms of how you speak to your patients that, things like listening the, the importance of listening active listening which sounds so basic and so obvious that that is easily forgotten when you get caught up in anxiety your nerves you know thinking about what you need to hit and what you need to cover you sometimes fall into the the habit of uh 
forgetting to listen or certainly process what you're hearing from the patient so that applies as it does uh, across all courses the listening signposting is super important the spec being specific with the signposting you know ask stating exactly what you're going on to ask and why um for example so there's some fundamentals that are the same I think throughout the courses but in terms of what is freely given to you um there is limitations on that with this new course I think and as it was with the CSA so I think fundamentally that's what we will help you with is how to actually extract information in a fluent way in a contextual way and not a formulaic way um, and our role players will be focusing on those interpersonal aspects, specifically those 14 statements in relating uh, to others. Louise, lovely to see you. Thank you. I know it was I caught you in a slightly difficult time with the kids. No, I but, don't um, worry. <laughs> I'll, I'll see you for our kind of final RCA course before we translate and transition into our yeah. SCA course, which I'm really excited. OK, I'll let you and go. I hope, to, I hope to see some of you on the course. It'd be Absolutely. Lovely to see you. <laughs> OK, see you Take later. Care. Bye. Bye. OK, so any other uh, questions that need to be asked? Uh, hopefully you found that useful, guys. A little introduction. Um, so Faria says there's no feedback with these RCGP videos. There's none. So it's, it's, it's difficult. You need to go away and have a look. But hopefully after tonight, when you, you know, printed out that mark sheet and looked at it and sort of thought about the case calibration, you'll get a better flavor for it. So thanks so much for joining us, guys. At least the weather's nice, eh? <laughs> okay, so I really hope to see you for the next uh, SCA webinar. Keep an eye on your emails. And um, hopefully I'll see you guys on the course also. Uh, oh dear, I've got exophthalmos after seeing the mark sheet. <laughs> I, know. I know, I think my vision deteriorated quite quickly after that too. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, well done. Okay, go and enjoy the rest of the evening. All right, go and have some dinner. All right, take care. Bye-bye.